I'm like, okay, well, what's responsible mean? All right, I'll buy a house or I'll buy some land. This is Property Investory where we talk to successful property investors to find out more about their stories, mindset and strategies. I'm Tyrone Shum and in this episode, we're speaking with Tam Thorogood who not only has dipped her foot in property investment but has also worked for the Air Force. Growing up on the Sunshine Coast, she found herself investing in renovating properties across different states and also discovering commercial property, allowing her to be financially free. Tam Thorogood delves into why she became an assistant project manager as well as being a property investor. Part-time, um, two and a half days per week and there's sort of a reason I'm, I'm doing that. It's uh, for a future development of my own properties. I wanted to learn the ropes. So yeah, I, I thought that was the best thing to do. So I'm studying a double diploma in construction and project management and landed myself a little two and a half day a week job. Thorogood goes on to explain what a typical day in her life looks like. Any given day, I generally start with either exercise or some sort of meditation and journaling. Then I'll do one or two things. I'll go off to my part-time job um, and learn the ropes of development or I'll work on my own property management of my um, commercial portfolio or I'll do a bit of study. Before learning the ropes about property development, Thorogood shares with us a little bit about her upbringing. I grew up on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, so a really lovely part of the world. I went to, to school here as well um, and I stayed on the coast till I was about 19 years old and then I went and joined the Air Force for three years which took me to Sydney and Canberra. That's fascinating. And so you, you finished school and you went straight into the army, is that what happened or did you actually take some time off and do something else? Look, I had a couple of little jobs, um, one in a bakery, one in a club, just sort of doing catering and bar work while I sort of decided what it was I wanted to do. And I actually, it was the Air Force I actually ended up going into. So while I was waiting for the process of being accepted, just had a few little jobs that kind of gave me some pocket money and then, yeah, got accepted in and did three years in, in the Air Force. What was the process involved? Is it the similar process where you apply for, say, a university degree or is it completely different? There's two ways you can join the forces. One is by being a non-commissioned officer. So that's where people who want to do a trade or be trained by the forces for, let's say, if you want to be a cook um, or work in warehousing or be a supplier or to go through a tertiary kind of process, that's when you look at becoming an officer and you go into Duntroon in Canberra. So I chose just to go in as a supplier. Uh, but yeah, there are both options, yeah. And she chose the option to be a supplier. Thargo elaborates why she made this decision. It's stores, warehousing, um, dangerous goods handling. So we supplied Army, uh, Air Force, Navy with every part or piece of equipment you could imagine from from a microchip to a piece of sort of plumbing equipment. So that's how it was run back then. Whether it's still like that, I'm not sure. But yeah, the, the warehouse I worked in was 800 metres long. Oh, wow. Yeah, it sounds like a little mini factory there in the background. Yeah, yeah, it was. So what interested you about the Air Force? Because I'm sure that there were so many other options out there. Why particularly the Air Force? It's funny you mentioned that I think I had a mindset from a from my family as well, get a good job, get a stable pay, be set for life. And the Air Force interested me because I wasn't really an office type person and I knew I could go into the Air Force doing something that, that wasn't sort of sitting at a desk. When was this roughly? Which time frame, I guess, or timeline? Uh, 25 years ago. Hang on. Yeah, I was, yeah, 20. I'm 48. <laughs> Thorogood explains how she was influenced to get into the Air Force following high school. I think from memory, they came around and did a talk, like a careers education kind of talk. Over three years, uh, obviously being in the Air Force, you would have been flying planes. Uh, is that what you're trained up to do? I was supporting the people who flew the planes. Let's, let's run with that. 
After her years of training in the Air Force, Thorogood picked up vital skills and work habits. It definitely, as a young person, set me up with some, some great work ethics. Um, you know, you showed up every day, you showed up on time, there was a hierarchy, you understood uh, discipline, respect, all those, um, those qualities that really help you through as you get older. And it really got me every job I ever really went for. It, um, not only does it, it look good on your resume, that wasn't the reason I joined the Air Force, but you know, people do know that you have to have certain standards to last in the Air Force or, or any service. So yeah, it, it really served me well and set me up well for, for ongoing employment and just general decision making in life. Thorogood had an interest in property investment from a young age but also had influences from her parents. I had interest in property, um, I guess, early 20s and to think back on how my parents might have influenced that, they actually used to own and operate pubs. So as a kid, I, I actually grew up in a in a pub, which the, in those days, the, the house was attached to the pub, so it was kind of cool, I thought. Um, and every Saturday, I would run out around the bar and pick up all the ones and two cent pieces. So I had a fascination with money from a young age, not necessarily property, but I'm, that, that shifted into property later on when, um, when my mum and I had a conversation actually and she told me to uh, become responsible and I, I didn't really know what that meant, but I figured buying, buying land or buying a house is a responsible thing to do, so that's what I did. After working in the Air Force, Thorogood found herself in other kinds of jobs before plunging into property investment. After that, I, I discharged from, um, from the services in, in Canberra and I saw an ad in a paper just while I was having a morning coffee which was for PMG, so Postmaster General which now we know as Telstra. And of course, I was looking for an outside type work. Um, or a physical type of job and it was for the first intake of female lines persons in sort of the history of, of PMG. So I applied for that and and got that job. So for everyone who's sort of listening, what that means is I was the person in the street uh, hauling the cable in the exchange, connecting your telephone up a pole, sort of hanging, putting wires together, that type of thing. So so yeah, that's uh, that's where I went to after after the forces, and that was really good. Wow. So PMG, I, honestly, I don't remember that name. I remember Telecom Australia or something like that. So that was PMG was before Telecom. So PMG was uh, included the the Australia Post as we know it now. They separated and went to uh, Telecom. Oh wow. <laughs> Then from Telecom, it went through to Telstra. So I spent 13 years in um, in Telstra, as we know it now, um, and that's really where I started my property journey was when I was working for them. Thorogood shares with us the details inside her Telstra job before making her way into the property investment world. Now you'd know it as a technician, so the person who you know, come and fixes your broadband, that sort of thing. So I did that sort of for about the first seven years and then I just progressed into management. Um, so initially sort of a team of 13 and then a team of 25 and then eventually up to um, 130 staff. I ran far north Queensland for, for a couple of years. So I just progressed through the ranks and they're an awesome company to work for. Um, they, they're they very supportive in in um, not, o- not only paying you well but training you well and teaching you lots of uh, lots of really good technical things and good management courses. So, yeah, that was a great place for me to flourish and learn how the corporates of the world work. After 15 years, what happened from there? I got to the stage where I was able to leave that job to do property renovating full-time. So, yeah, I made the decision. I, I myself and another business partner um, decided, yep, it's time to go. So, um I did that and I was renovating part time throughout Telstra pretty much my entire career. Um, and then it was, yeah, it was time to go. So that's how we sort of shifted into full time property renovating. Before becoming the successful property investor she is, Thorogood delves into her first property that gave her a little taste of investing. 
When I was 20, my mum said to me, I bought a motorbike, as you do when you're that age, and my mum said to me, <laughs> that's ridiculous, you know, be responsible. And like I said before, I'm like, okay, well, what's responsible mean? All right, I'll buy a house or I'll buy some land. And I had a look around and realised the only thing I could afford was a block of land, which was just um, where I currently was renting. So, yeah, bought that block of land for, I think, $40,000. Um, and then I thought, this is pretty good. Yeah, I like this. So I sort of kept looking at land and I bought another block for $10,000 because I still couldn't afford a house, but I could afford those two blocks um, in the hope that they would double as stories sort of were told back in those days. If you hold property, it'll double. And, and it did for me. So I sold those two blocks and I bought my first house. And whereabouts was that? One was in, the block of land was in Coolum Beach. The second block of land was in a really small town outside of Meribara in Queensland called Boonaroo. And then my first house, gosh, I should remember. Um, <laughs> my first house was in um, Fishman's Paradise down in New South Wales. From Sunshine Coast down to New South Wales, how come the, the I guess the distance between those two, was it because you moved to New South Wales for a period of time? To put the timeline on it, once I um, discharged from the forces in Canberra itself and I started work with, with telecom, um, I bought the land back up in the Sunshine Coast because that was kind of my home and I knew the area and I thought I'll always go back there. Um, and then I was still down obviously in Canberra, New South Wales and, and that's when I bought my house down there. So... So yeah, Telstra um, posted me around a lot. So my strategy was I just bought the worst house I could find in a kind of okay street and I'd renovate it in my spare time. The Sunshine Coast has always been home for Thorogood. But what was the intention to buy land there? The intention was the dream of having a block of land in a place that I loved and one day I would build on it. That's the thoughts I was having when I was 20. And did that come to, re to reality? Well, no, I, I mean, I had no strategy at that point. You know, I, I, I didn't even think about the vehicle of property to get to wealth. It was just like, oh, if I work really hard, you know, one day I can come back and I know I'll have this block of land that I've bought and I can hold it forever and at least I'll live back where I love. That sounds amazing. And you've invested in quite a lot of properties from residential, commercial and land and so forth. So in total, how large is your portfolio at this point in time? Right now, my portfolio is eight. That consists of where I live, um, three vendor finance residential units. So I'm the vendor finance um, person and then the rest of the balance is commercial. You've also done quite a number of renovations and sold different houses and units. Can you tell us a little bit about how many you've done there? The first stretch of my property career, I guess, was buying really poor houses in an okay spot and renovate renovating and pulling out some equity or selling them and moving on. So I literally did that for about 15 years and I would have done about 15 properties during that time. Gosh, that's a lot. After that, when I uh, met up with a friend and we became business partners, we moved into a similar strategy. However, we made sure there was some a little bit more value add and what I mean by value add would be we could subdivide that block or demolish the house and maybe put on a duplex as opposed to um, as opposed to just a single house. So we did about six or seven of those together as well. And that was in that first sort of stage of my property career. And then, yeah, things after that, global financial crisis kind of came along and I wasn't financially prepared. So I went back to work and had to think about what strategy might get me a little bit further ahead than that one? After remembering the GFC, Thorogood shares one of her worst investing moments that she ultimately learned a life lesson from. One really big lesson was in the time when um, we had the boom from mining towns and everyone was buying up in mining towns and for whatever reason, I thought because I'd been successful in doing some renovations and making money that way, that I could just buy any kind of property and it would be fine because I knew what I was doing and that completely wasn't the case. I purchased a property in a small town in WA called Newman and the 
mining company um, was going to rent it back off me. Now, that property purchase wasn't subject to finance. However, I was getting my portfolio revalued, so the bank still wanted to do a valuation. Now, the hype of the market had had the, the banks doing desktop valuations back then for, for whatever reason. And for some lucky reason for me, the ANZ bank drove out and cited that property for me. And they gave me a call and they said, have you seen this property? And I said, no, I've, I've seen pictures. That's all I've seen. And he said, well, what are you expecting? I said, well, I'm expecting a upmarket demountable with a pool, fully air conditioned, three bedroom. And he said, well, that's not what you're getting. There is no pool. There is no air conditioning. It's a demountable sitting on a dirt block. And I went, wow. Okay. So that was a very nervous moment for me because the contract was unconditional at that stage. Like I said, he was just revaluing my portfolio. So I kind of went, wow, what am I going to do here? So I rang the person who was selling it to me and we had some pretty interesting conversation. And the upshot of a, of a lot of to and fro was that he ended up buying that back off me. Um, yeah, in this circumstance. So yeah, huge, huge lesson of two things. One, just because you do a few sort of good property transactions doesn't mean you know everything. And two, stick to your strategy. <laughs> How did you find this particular property in the first place that, you know, there's you thought there was opportunity in there? Yeah, with the mining boom, they were, they were everywhere really. If you were looking to invest and trying to get uh, positive cash flow property, really all you had to do is look in a mining town and it was available. You, we were sort of buying properties that were costing 300000 you could rent them back to a mining company for $600 a week. So, it was right in, in the middle of the boom. Despite Thorogood's bad luck with this particular property, she explains what happened with the valuation. Thankfully, at that time, I had enough equity in my portfolio and, and it was okay, but I didn't want to be left with a property that wasn't worth what I thought it was going to be worth. So I really needed to get out of it, not proceed somehow. Um, and like I said, ended up selling it back to the guy who I, I bought it off um, Thankfully, otherwise, yeah, it'd be a few hundred thousand down the drain. I, I, I couldn't see any way forward or any value that that property would hold moving forward given the, the condition of it. I'm just curious why the person that sold it to you was able to buy back off you. <laughs> That's very interesting. I think he was nervous given that what he tried to sell me was not what he had sold me and I'm sure it wasn't his first time. So, yeah, I, I brought out my angry voice. <laughs> Thankfully, it did, yeah, but it was it was a really uncertain time and it, and, it, and it really was a really big error on my part to buy something sight unseen, rely on a photo and just think that everything would be okay. Even with the hiccups along her property journey, Thargood shares the moment where everything clicked for her. About 10 years ago, I did a Rich Dad, Poor Dad in, um, international investing course, I think it was called. Um, it was a nine-month course and at the very beginning of that course, we had to fill out a very basic assets and liabilities sheet, just a, just a one-pager. And as I filled that out, I saw the number that was left at the bottom, which was negative $795 a month. And I was quite shocked because I had a portfolio worth a few million dollars and I kind of went, wow, what what am I doing if I'm trying to retire from cash flow from property? And that made a huge, a huge difference in the way I looked at my portfolio at that time, which at that point I started selling my properties that were negatively geared because for me I determined I wanted cash flow and I wanted cash flow from day one. I didn't want to rely on a tax return. I didn't want to rely on depreciation and all the things that go along with that. I wanted it in my pocket from day one. And the aha moment behind that? My partner was renting a commercial building and the owner had always said, hey, anytime you want to buy this building, let me know. So I said, how about you ask how much they want? So 
We asked the purchase price. I ran some numbers on how much rent we were paying and I looked at the bottom line and I went, if I buy this, my negative $7.95 goes to positive $1,000 per month. And I just went, oh my God, what have I been doing all this time? <laughs> it was, yeah, I was just like, I felt like Blind Freddy because the, the numbers were staring me in the face and I was still choosing to sort of ignore them in the past. Yeah, dropped big time, big time. So what happened next then from that, from that aha moment? Where did you go to actually make changes? I did buy that property. Um, I sold two other residential properties uh, that I had that I couldn't see any way forward to make them positive cash flow. And then I, the three units that I said I had under vendor finance, that was the way I made them positive cash flow. So that's almost, uh, actually it's better returns than I get from my commercial properties at the moment. So they were kept because I could make them positive. Thorogood goes into depth about what exactly is vendor financing and how it works. I act kind of like the bank if you think of it that way. Basically, I put those three properties up for sale under the proviso that if someone couldn't get a bank loan for some reason, whether they had defaulted or been bankrupt in the past but they now had a good income or they'd had a bad credit rating from something really minor, it meant that I would say, okay, I will lend you the money to purchase this property for an interest rate like a bank's interest rate. So you would probably make a margin on top of the bank rate as well too? Would that be the case? They can, I'm making a margin on, um, on mine. Some, some do, some don't. But in my situation, yeah, I, I make 2% more than what a bank would charge and you just agree on a current variable rate or a fixed rate. And I also make a full rate on the gap. Now, when I say the gap, for example, the property costs 700000 because I'm selling it to them and we're settling in the future. I've sold it to them for a million dollars. So I'm also earning interest on the $300,000 gap. As vendor financing deals are not commonly discussed, she explains why she has been involved with them. I knew one, one of my mentors had done it quite a while ago and had mentioned it to me. Um, yeah, I agree. It's not something that's common, particularly in Queensland. It, it is pretty common I'm led to believe in in southern states in Victoria, um, but yeah, I I just kind of I read a book how to buy a house for a dollar. I think it was. Oh, by Rick Otten. Yeah, 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 and it and it has some uh, similar concepts in there. And I went, I light bulb came on, and I looked into vendor finance, and I thought I'm going to do this. So I did sort of kiss a few toads along the way to get the final the final person who did take up the, the property under vendor finance terms, but it was well worth it. So how long have you had th- those deals, those three deals under vendor financing for now? A little over three years now. Great. When does it expire? It's a 30-year loan term, so another 27 years. As long as, as long as they don't sell, I'm happy. Do you see those type of people selling up or are they happy just to continue to, I guess, look at owning it out um, eventually? Is that basically the whole idea that they're almost renting to, to buyers in that sense? Is that right? Yeah, it is similar to rent to buy. It was an investor who bought these ones. So, I, I believe that, you know, it, his strategy is to buy and hold because it is in a uh, medium density residential area and it is just three units uh, single story so that's his initial um his initial plan whether that changes in the future you know who knows but in the meantime you know the the longer he hangs on to that the, the happier i am thoroughgood delves into the details about her different kinds of strategies that have ultimately influenced her property journey when i did have the aha uh, moment of negative cash in my pocket as opposed to having positive cash in my in my pocket I really, I was highly motivated to change that. Um, with, with mindset of investing in property, a lot of the time, well, for me, I thought I knew what I was doing it for, but I really didn't have any meat around what that meant. I was just trying to accumulate property. So when I went through the Rich Dad training course and really got into the numbers, I broke down how much money I needed to replace my income and then how much money I thought I needed to live a comfortable life 
from assets in, in, in property. So I worked really hard to change my portfolio around, like I said, with the vendor finance units, um, buying my partner's commercial property, and then purchasing another three commercial assets after that, all that I was very confident of running the numbers, knowing that they would put more money in my pocket from day one than I had before I bought them. How long did that process take you to get to where you are now? That's probably been the last six years and, and to help me on along the way, I learn by doing um, as opposed to kind of reading. It doesn't work as well for me. So I decided to become a commercial real estate agent so I could get in on the inside. So I thought if I'm going to invest in commercial property, I need to know how it works. And, and the best thing for me to do was to go and become a commercial real estate agent. So while I was accumulating over the past six years, I did that for three years. As commercial real estate agents are harder to come by, Thorogood tells us what she learned within the role. No one likes you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's not a good sign. <laughs> it's a yeah, um, look, it, it's a it's a tough gig, but I I had a my mindset going in was that you know for the purpose of learning everything I possibly could about commercial real estate, I wanted to understand what was a good deal and what wasn't a good deal um, from an agent's point of view, from vendors selling. I wanted to observe the owners out there who were leasing properties because, as you know, in commercial you do you know, you can do both, which is selling and leasing. So I wanted to see what a good landlord looked like and what landlords who struggled to get tenants looked like. I wanted to understand what made a good asset, what made it desirable for people to want to buy or to want to rent. So yeah, over those three years, I just really became a student of the commercial market and understanding terminology, yields, what the market wants, what people are prepared to buy. So that was really the main purpose that I did that. Along the way, did you also make a bit of money through commercial real estate? I did, not a lot. <laughs> I made enough to feed myself and and <laughs> and not um, you know, and not struggle too much. But yeah, I made it I I think I made about fifty thousand dollars gross um, along the way. So each year. So yeah, it was enough to to get me by for sure. Thorogood explains where she was located as a commercial real estate agent. Yeah, I was on the sunny coast. Um, I had thought this is what I wanted to do. So a year prior, I went and knocked on um, Collier's, Savile's, CBRE door and I said, you know, I want to be an agent and and they said, that's great. We'll call you if, we'll call you if we've got a spot. So that didn't happen. So I went and sort of got a, a job at the local, a local brand just to kind of cut my teeth on. Um, and then once I'd done 12 months with them, I went back and knocked on, on the door and Savills on the Sunshine Coast gave me a job. After working in a large company as a commercial real estate agent, Thorogood gives us an insight on what it's like. The Brisbane office did do a lot of very, very large transactions and I guess we got to see sort of the ins and outs of those uh, happen. On the Sunshine Coast, there's there were few and far between of very large transactions, but there was enough certainly to give to give me the exposure I needed and and have a look at how that all works, um, you know, corporate brand, how they market, all that sort of thing. So it was definitely eye opening. The one mistake I made was because they were a corporate company, I thought it might be similar to the corporate environment at Telstra, which it wasn't. I forgot I was an agent and every man's for himself. So I did I did miss the camaraderie. Yeah, it's it's really dog eat dog. Even when you work in the same office, you would know having been an agent, it's a, it's a tough, tough gig. Thargo thinks about what she took away from the company and how she applied it to her own portfolio. Yeah, definitely understanding what it means to be a good landlord. So maintaining buildings, putting a little bit of capital back into buildings that you know become tired connecting with your tenants on a regular basis they're in business just like you are so just doing a set and forget or or you know this terminology of passive income it's it's certainly not passive you certainly have to be engaged and treat it like a business so those landlords who kept engaged with their tenants worked with them heard them you know, when there are tough times, sometimes rather than losing a tenant, the best thing to do is to help them out. 
Um, because if you have a vacancy in commercial, as you know, it can be, you know, two years if if you're in the wrong spot. So, yeah, that's I learnt that that lesson and I've adopted that and it's working very well for me. So, when did you purchase your first commercial property to now the fourth commercial property? So, when was that start, time frame? Yeah, that would have been in about um, 2014. Yeah, 2013 or 14, yeah. And then uh, you, you've purchased a total of four or you have a total of four commercial properties. When was the last one that you purchased? Uh, the last one was about 18 months ago. Yeah, so I sort of bought uh, three in quick succession and then as I learned from um, my mistakes and from being an agent, um, I feel like I've chosen the next property I chose was a little bit better. Um, yeah, so and I'll look to purchase, a, oh, I'm looking to purchase a, a, a second one sort of right now. She dives into the details about the type of commercial properties she has purchased, starting off with her first purchase. Yeah, the first one was my partner's clinic, so a physio clinic which is deemed to be medical. Um, so that sort of made me start looking at the types of tenants that I would like or I thought worked best from a long-term perspective and definitely medical is is one. The reasons being is um, you generally get a higher rate per square metre. I'm talking a little bit sort of technical now but but with uh, medical fit outs, there's normally extra things like extra hand basins and extra uh, parking. So you can get a higher rent for that. Also, the type of tenant being medical generally have a better financial track record of being and remaining in business. And we are an aging population. So for me, medical was sort of a no-brainer. So yeah, medical and professional typically are the, the two types of tenants and the types of buildings that I like to purchase. This made sense for Thoroughgood as it helps with longevity of a commercial property. If you haven't provided the fit out for the tenant and they have as well, generally they're they're very heavily invested, you get a longer lease which again, if you have a nice long lease and you go to the bank and you're lending, um, it's it's far easier to get your finance for that. What kind of value did you did the purchase that first one for because people's misconceptions of commercial is that it costs a lot of money. Yeah, that was uh, 285000 What kind of return did you get on that? Like what kind of percentage return? 8.3 net. Obviously, with something like that too, um, going to the bank um, because it's a business type of loan or commercial loan, you'd have to put a lot more money up front, right, as a deposit. Yeah, generally speaking, it's 35%. You, you can um, get less but it's all relative and what I mean by relative is that your interest rate goes up the more your LVR is. So. If you want to put down 20% deposit, that might be, for argument's sake, a 6% interest rate. But if you do 35%, it'll be a 4% interest rate. So the more money you can put up, the better. And also the more money you put up, the more choice of lender and terms that you have. Can we talk a little bit more about the other type of um, properties? Have they been similar to this one or have they been different for the commercial side? They have been similar. Um, so I've got a professional professional office which has a solicitor in it was the next one that we bought. Um, the the one after that was another health type uh, or allied health being a exercise physiologist. And then the one after that, because I was working in real estate, I actually bought a vacant building in commercial when buildings aren't tenanted. The, they can be worth a lot less because uh, there's no one in them. So I saw the opportunity of buying something vacant, knowing I was in the industry, finding a tenant, putting a tenant in and building in some instant equity. Thorngood discusses more about the empty property that she purchased and where it's at now. Yeah, it did stay empty for 12 months. I did have to do some work to it. Um, and then we've got a tenant who took um, a lease for the whole building. It's quite a large building. It's standalone, 330 square metres in the centre of town near a train station. Um, and that tenant 
failed after three months, which was, yeah, a bit of a, a, a disappointment. So what we did was re-advertise and try and find someone who had did what's called an assignment of lease. So basically take their lease over. We were lucky enough to do that for them because they were in financial distress. And now I have a retailer in there who's been there for nearly 12, oh, just under 12 months and going really well. How much less did you purchase it off the market? It was advertised for 580000 originally and I quite liked the building so I just watched it for a little while because I thought no one, no one will buy that. Mm. Um, and then it dropped down to 520000 and um, I thought, okay, all right, it's getting a little bit better and then I went to the agent and I said, I'll give you 440000 and they said, no way. And I said, okay, no problem. <laughs> um, and then two months later, they called me and they said, we'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> As usual, time, time passes, yes. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, now that I have a tenant in it, to, I guess to give you the difference in what I purchased it for and what it would be worth now, um, it would be about 150000 difference in in equity that or instant equity from now that I have a tenant in there. Even having it vacant for 12 months, that in, had an increased value of 150000 So, it's definitely worthwhile as, you, as you've said. But if it was vacant now, it'd still only be worth what I bought it for. So, it's the tenant that the tenant that makes, you know, adds the value to the property. It's just the way commercial works, yeah. Did you have any issues funding that particular property? Uh, no, I knew I had to buy that with cash and I only could afford to buy one property with cash. That was all the money I had, but I knew it would be worth it. So actually right now I'm looking at going to the bank to get that refinanced. It's not quite as easy as residential. Um, they do they do have stricter terms when it's already a purchased building as opposed to purchasing a building. So once I go through that process, I can let you know how it goes. Due to Thorogood's multifaceted portfolio, she has adopted multiple strategies and ways of thinking. I think um, because I've done a, a few strategies over a, a long period of time, set out what it is you want to do and be very clear about it. Break it right down. That was probably an, uh, an early error that I, that I made that I wished I had have done um, and really understand why you're doing it. Choosing not to go down the residential path Thargo explains her reasoning for doing this. I decided I wanted to invest also for certainty. So for me, because I didn't enjoy reading a lot, um, researching what future capital growth might be was quite arduous for me. So when I decided to switch to, to commercial, I knew exactly it was worth what I paid for I was either getting income or I wasn't, I either had a tenant or I didn't, irrespective, I don't buy anything for capital growth at all. If I get capital growth, that's great, but I purely invest for cash flow. So from a residential point of view, I'm sure there are some out there that are, that are. I've just stopped looking for them because it's easier for me and I know the commercial market now. So that's the easy way to go and, and I'll stick with that. Not only has Thorogood dipped her feet in commercial and residential, she also was inspired to get into development. So the commercial property that I'm holding has development potential. So from a long-term perspective in seven, eight years sort of looking ahead, when I get to that point of, of knowing that my properties could be developed, what I wanted to, to achieve and what I'm wanting to achieve now is I may not necessarily personally develop them myself, but I want to have an idea of how it works. I want to understand the right questions to ask a project manager or a developer or understand how the finance works around development so I can best prepare myself when I get there. Hopefully by then, I should know what I'm talking about. That's very, very smart, especially gaining that hands-on experience from already existing developments and, and getting that access to those things makes a huge, huge difference, doesn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm on a huge, huge learning curve, so it's, it's awesome. I really, really do enjoy it. I don't think I'm a developer as such. You've got to have 
<laughs> can have a lot of gumption to be a developer and really play a long-term game. And it does, you know, it costs a lot of money to do those sorts of things, but the rewards are there. But yeah, I certainly want to understand the process and, and I do enjoy the process of, of learning about it. You are actually living off this passive income at this point in time and that's funding your life or are you still building this up to where you wanted to meet those goals you set back at Rich That Training? Uh, no, I certainly met those goals that um, that we set at Rich Dad Training. So, yes, yeah, so I theoretically, I could support myself through the properties that I have now. Um, it's just I want to be busy. I want to still, you know, I find it enjoyable to still, um, you know, purchase property and look at deals and and look at this development stuff. It's interesting. It's It's quite boring if you just stop everything at home. It's, yeah, it's certainly something I can't see myself doing. With a strong passion for property, we take a look at Thorogood's reasoning behind her why. My why really is so that when, if and when there ever comes a need that I need to help my family, perhaps look after my parents is probably one main thing is that I can afford to do that and that I'll have the time to do that. So that was my driving motivation was yeah, really to, to make sure I have choices in life that I can best support my own family and friends to a certain extent as well. You know, I love sort of, I've got a close knit group of friends who, when they need help, I can help them out. You know, with time mainly, without having to worry about you know where my income's coming from. Throughout Thoroughgood's property journey, there have been some resources and mentors that have inspired her. Initially, I was heavily into Steve Knight and his programs. That was sort of on the residential and flipping and that side of things. Um, when I did shift to, to go into commercial, it was quite difficult to find a mentor. And um, I ended up finding one that was in a swimming group that I was in who I would ask to meet for a, a cup of tea once a month and just try and pick his brain um, on commercial. But still, it wasn't enough, which is why I needed to be a commercial agent. But um, yeah, so Steve McKnight, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that's probably from a property investing point of view that the two the two main ones that really influenced yeah i know steve's got his own book that he's written same thing as, as robert kiyosaki as well do you have any other books that you could potentially recommend i would uh, i'm an audio book kind of girl ah, good um, okay yeah audio books yeah. great yeah i would recommend um ego is the enemy by ryan halliday oh okay that's the first i've heard that one before that's great okay i know yeah, ryan so halliday Really good book for me to get out of my own way, uh, I guess is the, the best way to put it. And also just understand, you know, doing things for yourself, it's it's your own path and you're not doing it to impress anyone else or for any other reason, you know, than, than what you originally thought you were going to do it for. So, yeah, it's a re it was a really good book for me. As she takes a look back on her journey, she shares with us the best advice she has received. You've got time. I'm always in a rush. I guess that's what happens with uh, serial entrepreneurs and, and successful, you know, business owners and so forth. They're always on the go, never stops. Definitely. Yeah, look, less is more. So, yeah, I've got time and, and less is more. I felt that I had to be busy to be achieving and we all know that's totally not the case. How have you been able to sort of reduce what you have but also achieve more? I adopted um, meditation about four years ago. So... That's um, for me being been a pivotal little act that I do three times a week. That's all I could sort of get it down to. I tried every day, didn't work. So, but I've now I've nailed it. I'm three times a week solid. So, I'd say that's yeah, that's what's really helped me. If Thorogood had some time to reflect on her past self ten years ago, we find out what she would have said to herself. You're on the right track. Keep going. What period of time would they have uncertainty? If yeah, within the last 10 years, I, you know, I've been quite, well, the last eight years, very, very solid. Um, so, it was probably pre that that I'd have a bit of different advice for myself. So, but in the last 10 years, yeah, definitely I'm on the right track. Keep going. It's okay to switch strategies. I'm in the same, I'm in the same um, space. I'm still in property. She talks about the future, painting the picture of what is happening for her in the upcoming five years. Acquiring a few more commercial properties is definitely on, on the cards. Very excited about that. Um, I'm very excited about private equity lending in the construction space. So, um, delving into becoming a private equity lender. 
Um, and then, yeah, development after that, maybe. It sounds very, very exciting. Is there going to be a point where you go, okay, I've reached enough commercial properties in my portfolio or are you just going to continue to add those on? I think I'll continue to add those on. They'll just be of a different type potentially. And last question I usually ask all my guests on the show is how much of your success is due to your skill, intelligence and hard work and how much of it is because of luck? For me, it's all hard. Yeah, it's all hard work. I've really had to grind it out. And, and stick with it for sure. Yeah, it's there's not much luck for me, unfortunately. <laughs> I think that's the thing, you create your own luck and it sounds like that's what you've done successfully. Yeah, definitely. It's not, it, for anyone who thinks it's passive income out there, you know, I've changed that word a long time ago. It's definitely not passive. You, you're running a business and you need to get the returns that a business deserves, otherwise get out of the business. 